Well, it's been a long day, I would bet, for all of you. Uh, and uh, there's always the risk of being the last person in a symposium of this sort, that everything will have been said by everybody except the last speaker, who then has to say it again. And I will try not to make that error. Uh, it is at least an opportunity for me to say something from a personal perspective and not try to summarize the meeting. I've been asked to do that occasionally at meetings that I haven't attended, and that is truly a, a challenging task. <laughs> so I won't uh, try to do that. I regret I missed uh, all of the wonderful presentations because of a commitment made many months ago uh, to be at a meeting in New York. And I was in New York until 1 o'clock this afternoon, so thank you, uh, Asela. You actually were on time today, <laughs> even if this symposium wasn't quite, but that's all right. So I do want to say a few things about looking back and looking forward. It's going to be a pretty high-level view because I think at this point that's probably what you would want to hear uh, from the NIH director who formerly had a hand in this remarkable experience called the Human Genome Project. So it will be a little bit of where did we come from and it will be a little bit of where we're going to go. And some of it will be serious and some of it, frankly, will be a little bit silly because at this point, you're probably ready for some of that too. So as soon as I figure out which of these buttons, ah, well, this is what we're here to celebrate and I did wear my DNA tie. And if nobody looks too closely, you won't notice that one of the three strands here is actually a left-handed helix. Pay no attention. Two out of three isn't bad. And you know, the people who design these things apparently don't understand how critical that is. Uh, for us to be able to hold our heads up or wear our uh, appropriate garb. But here we are, and it is pretty remarkable to say it's been 10 years uh, since that conclusion. Uh, the first time we said we'd finish the human genome sequence and sort of meant it, uh, April 2003. But of course, that didn't uh, come about without a great deal of discussion and deliberation, and uh, David has already referred to the Alberts panel, and this is the Alberts panel a publication there in green. Uh, which was very much an important step in giving this genome project some specificity, some credibility, uh, some scientific milestones, a course over which one could actually see things go forward and know whether it was happening. And at the same time, although not nearly as much referred to, the Office of Technology Assessment came up with a similar report, and that, I think, made a turning point. But frankly, for those of you who weren't around, even after the publication of this, I would say the majority of the scientific community was either skeptical or actually, frankly, opposed uh, to this project going forward. Because of the concern it was technically unfeasible, it might take away the money for their R01s, or it was just, frankly, so boring that nobody who was a good scientist would want to work on it. There was that one, too, which was all, I thought, rather patently offensive, but there it was. Unfortunately. That did not come true, because you could argue, I think, quite convincingly that one of the reasons the Genome Project succeeded was because it was so compelling, it was so game-changing, it was so interdisciplinary, it had such opportunities for creativity from multiple perspectives that it attracted uh, some of the best and brightest scientists of our generation. Uh, whether or not they had their arms twisted by Jim Watson, they all came. And they came enthusiastically, and they stuck with it, and they didn't worry too much about who was going to get the credit, because that was obviously going to be a big team enterprise. So it got underway, uh, roughly, in October of 1990, as far as the NIH part of it. And then a couple of quick milestones from that 13-year enterprise, but I'll only hit upon maybe one or two. I do think it's appropriate to point out that not only did the Genome Project break new ground technologically, but it also broke new ground in terms of data release, data access, openness, giving the data away. And this uh, particular slide, a picture of the people who attended the Bermuda meeting in 1996 where this decision was made, also includes a photograph of what was written on the whiteboard uh, by John Solston and Bob Waterston leading a session that came to the conclusion that all the data from the Genome Project should be released uh, every 24 hours and there should be no filing of intellectual property claims upon this information. It ought to be just out there for all the smart people in the world to begin to figure out how to use it. And again, that has really been, I think, a seminal moment in that it has changed the dynamic for genomics and increasingly for other aspects of biomedical research as well into one where if you're involved in a large-scale community project of this sort, it is your obligation uh, to make that data available as soon as you're sure it's right, even in advance of publication. And I think that has enhanced progress in ways that cannot be overstated. 
Oh, well, other uh, milestones to mention. Uh, well, after a while, we actually did get uh, the sequence put together in a draft form. We had a nice party uh, on June 26th of 2000, even though uh, John Solston famously said we were all a bunch of phonies because we hadn't actually published a paper at that point. And there was a little bit of a problem there, but uh, we, we got to that. Uh, so February 2001, uh, this paper describing a draft version of the human genome sequence with a cover intentionally designed to convey the idea that this was DNA, but it was also about humanity. And we had a little fun with that. If you stared at that cover closely, you may find there are a few surprises. There's one of them just sort of hiding in there in the mosaic, uh, Watson and Crick, whose discovery, of course, we celebrate today, 60 years after the publication of that April 25th, 1953 paper which essentially got this whole thing started. And in 2003, 10 years ago, the finished version of the human genome sequence uh, possible to put out. And some people said, okay, that's good, we're done with that. Now we're in the post-genomic era, and that's when I started to go nuts about that phrase, and I will continue to for many years to come, because until we've actually figured out the genome and how it functions, which I think David has made rather clear, we are a long way away from, we're still in the genomic era. Let's be sure we are happy about that, we're celebrating that, we're making the most of that. We did, of course, not stop there. The focus on human variation, a natural place for attention to be turned, and an opportunity also there for a large-scale coordinated international effort and a lot of technological developments in order to speed up the ability to do SNP genotyping, uh, coming forth as the HapMap project and moving quite swiftly, uh, creating an ever deeper database of human genetic variation and making it possible, as you heard, I'm sure, from Nancy Cox earlier today, uh, to make a, a wide variety of discoveries about common variants that are associated with risks of common disease, here depicted by this myriad of colored circles now numbering well in the thousands. And yes, while many of these do in fact convey rather modest odds ratios, to say the least, uh, they are nonetheless clearly statistically significant. I should mention that one of the hoped for outcomes here has been slow to happen, namely to use this information to try to identify new possibilities for intervening for those common diseases. And I'm having the experience right now, finally, after a few years uh, of wheel spinning, of working closely with 10 pharmaceutical company heads of R&D to try to figure out how could one apply a filter to this set to actually identify those GWAS findings that are most likely to be pointing to a druggable target that we didn't know about. There must be some in here because the, the positive controls turn up on this list. If you're looking for evidence that this might be a good way to find drug targets, it will probably encourage you to notice that most of the known drug, drug targets for things like cholesterol or diabetes turned up in this particular survey without our having biased the situation to make it so. So while this has thus far been, I think, somewhat disappointing as far as predictions of individual future risk because the odds ratios are quite small and we're still missing a lot of the heritability and a lot of the environmental influences, it still seems to me that perhaps the major advantage here uh, is to understand disease pathogenesis and pathways and to utilize that information to come up with new ideas about therapeutics. And we really haven't taken advantage of that as we might have, and it's time. Of course, we needed to know as much as we possibly could uh, about genomes and uh, what we could learn in terms of full sequences. And the folks that have been conducting that uh, deserve a lot of pro uh, pr uh, compliments uh, and applause for what's been done. And I guess uh, just today I learned uh, that the low coverage and exome sequencing of 2,500 samples, which is one of the goals, has now been placed up there on an FTP site. Uh, so that there's even more data than before. And this is teaching us a huge amount of interesting things about genetic variation across the world. Already mentioned, and I'm sure described in much more detail by Levi Garraway, uh, a direct implication and application of the ability to do high-throughput genome sequencing at increasingly low cost has been the application to cancer. And I think uh, we all see those data sets coming forward uh, at increasing speed. Uh, with great hopes that this will lead us not only to better ideas about how to identify subsets of cancers, which is happening almost Im immediately when one has these tools, but also uh, to target therapy more effectively. And we are now somewhere in the neighborhood of having 11,000 uh, tumors uh, in the pipeline to be completed by the end of 2014, 
uh, through the NCI uh, NHGRI effort, the Cancer Genome Atlas, and more to come through the international effort. But I think it would be uh, uh, remiss to simply talk about DNA sequencing as a study of the genome uh, as our goal here for genomics in this genomic era. Clearly, uh, I will align myself with a lot of what David said about the importance of understanding function and pathways and networks and systems. And I have found uh, the ENCODE project to be enormously inspiring because of the ability to begin to do some of that and to develop methods that allow you to begin uh, to see it is how variation connects to gene expression uh, and many other things as well. And so ENCODE uh, now having produced uh, remarkable data sets, uh, including the mod ENCODE effort, and I'm sure you heard more about this, uh, seems to me to stand also as a major contribution uh, to our understanding of what we should be doing to, to get the genome's function in front of us. Uh, of course, in 2012, last year, a big outpouring of results from that, 30 plus papers, uh, so many papers and so much information, in fact, that Nature had to put up this explorer to allow people to dig through the data and find uh, the connections if you were looking for a particular kind of information, if you haven't had the chance to play with that. Certainly people in my lab found that extremely interesting as we are trying to sort out how it is that the pancreatic islet utilizes its genome in health and disease uh, to make insulin or not enough. But of course, this is, uh, I guess, uh, just one example, all of these things that I'm talking about, about the proliferation of data sets that we increasingly depend on to understand biology. And we at NIH became increasingly alarmed about whether we had our house in order as far as the computational aspects of that. And so we invited uh, some experts, including some people who are here, to advise us about what we should be doing about the so-called problem of big data, which I don't think of as a problem, it's an opportunity. But it will be a problem if you don't prepare for it adequately. And this big data uh, explosion uh, presents us uh, with challenges both in terms of algorithms, in terms of hardware, and in terms of training. And NIH received uh, this report from the Data Informatics Working Group uh, now not quite a year ago, and we have acted rather swiftly uh, to take action upon it. We've put together uh, a set of internal governing bodies that go across all of the NIH institutes and started a new trans-NIH in initiative, which is called BD2K, Big Data to Knowledge, which includes the potential of funding centers of excellence, but also a very major focus on training. We don't want to see NIH-supported trainees coming out of graduate training or postdoc training without being skilled in computational approaches to biology. They will simply not be able to be competitive or be able to make the kinds of insights happen that we're counting on. And we have a new leadership position, the Associate Director for Data Science, which you can see is very nicely abbreviated as ADS, because it is supposed to be mathematical. And we have an acting ADS, namely Eric Green himself, uh, who is both getting this enterprise going and also co-chairing the search committee to try to replace himself as soon as possible, because I imagine he's wearing enough hats already. Uh, but anyway, if you have great ideas about who would be the perfect person to step into this role, I'm sure Eric would like to hear from you. So all of this has, in terms of the medical applications, resulted in pretty dramatic consequences. Uh, we uh, heard from David that perhaps there are 5,000 Mendelian disorders for which we have the known molecular basis, and in fact, uh, this comes out of OMIM. It's just about that, maybe 4,800. We are all pretty much in the same place here on these numbers. And look at the way in which that has happened beginning in the 1990s. That's not by accident. That's because first genetic and physical maps and then increasingly sequence abilities came along and made this kind of effort possible. And of course, it's accelerating now with the ability with even rarer conditions to be able to use exome sequencing on very small numbers of families, uh, sometimes even one or two, <laughs> to be able to find a mutation that is causative of the disease. And that is going to cause this curve, I suspect, to jump up a bit more steeply in the next couple of years, and that's a good thing. And in a few instances, at least, that has resulted in dramatic outcomes uh, in those instances where that discovery in the circumstance of an undiagnosed disease leads you to the idea of an intervention that you would not have come up with otherwise. Uh, here on this stage, uh, back in the fall, we had something called the celebration of science, and at the conclusion of that, perhaps 
sort of the most uh, impressive example of how this sort of genomic sequencing has changed lives. Uh, we had on the stage the Beery family and uh, uh, the two um, kids there, uh, not the one in the middle who's the older sibling, but the other two who are twins, uh, came out after their mom and dad told the story of these two who developed an increasingly uh, awful uh, form of neurologic degeneration and dystonia and were found on sequencing of their genomes to both be homozygous for the loss of function in a pre previously undescribed uh, pathway which basically meant that it could not uh, make either dopamine or serotonin and simply by supplying them with both L-DOPA and dietary supplementation of 5-hydroxytryptamine uh, these two went uh, under a rather remarkable, almost miraculous recovery in the space of weeks. Now, we wish that that would happen all the time, and it doesn't, but those examples do give one uh, some inspiration that we're on the right track here, at least in some instances. Obviously, this worked because a lot of people had done a lot of very good biology previously about the pathways that were involved so that you knew when you found the mutation what might be the right dietary and pharmaceutical intervention. So. That's the good news in terms of the discovery of disorders uh, in the molecular basis. The part that I think we should not feel so good about is this, that as of right now, of those 5,000 disorders or so, there are only 250 of them that have a therapy that is considered to be appropriately beneficial. A huge gap. Now, we all know that gap is a tough one to cross because there's so many steps involved and many of these are very rare diseases where in fact the expectation of any real serious private sector interest has got to be muted by the lack of anything like a very uh, uh, large market uh, for financial purposes. But I, do, I don't think it's appropriate though for us to just shake our heads and go, well, that's the way it is. I do think there are things we can do uh, to speed up the process of going from gene discovery uh, to therapeutics. That long 14-year typical uh, pipeline uh, has some aspects of it that could be susceptible uh, to new scientific ideas and are, in fact, being tackled now in systematic ways uh, in partnerships between public and private that no company would undertake on their own. And that was, in fact, the motivation uh, to start for the first time in quite a while a new center at NIH, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences which has already, I think, made a significant impact in this space, albeit with very modest funding. The only new funding for this effort that was not already there from other things that were cobbled together is something in the neighborhood of 0.2 percent uh, of the NIH budget. But it has allowed us to focus on things like how to do better job of drug toxicology testing than the tried and true and often not so true uh, testing of animals. It's also allowed us to set up a program to repurpose compounds that had failed for one application but might turn out to be just the thing for a rare disease where you just discovered the molecular basis. And a few other things as well. So I think it is uh, an interesting development and one which, while a very modest uh, form of new financial contributions, potentially uh, might get us closer to closing that yawning gap between what we know about diseases and what we can do about them. And of course, uh, this was a uh, center that attracted some controversy. Anytime we do something at NIH that sounds like we're building a new enterprise, people are worried about, okay, where is that coming from and what kind of consequences will there be uh, for funding of other things? It seems that we're in that space again here in the last month or so because we have a new kid on the block here uh, in terms of NIH uh, in initiatives, namely the Brain Initiative, Brain Research to Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. Uh, this is an enterprise announced by the President on April 2nd, which is very basic science. This is an effort to try to build very fundamental ideas about how circuits in the brain work, starting with model organisms, because the human brain is way too complicated with its 86 billion neurons. But we don't really have at the present time a very good understanding of how to record simultaneously from tens of thousands of neurons and be able to assess how it is in real time that some complex function is being carried out. How do the emergent properties of the brain actually emerge? Uh, you'll never really learn that by studying one neuron at a time. Uh, you've got to get into the complexity business. And that was the motivation for this. Again, a modest scale, $40 million dedicated to this next year for NIH and FY14. If you're doing the math, you'll know that's slightly over 0.1% of the budget, but just slightly. 
but potentially also an opportunity to bring together uh, scientists from multiple disciplines, nanotechnologists, engineers, neuroscientists, to see if we could, kind of in a genome project-like way, uh, to learn to talk to each other and develop new ideas about what to do. This project clearly needs, just like the Alberts panel did, a blueprint of what exactly are going to be the steps, and that is something that is now under construction, being led by a very capable team, uh, uh, which Corey Bargman and Bill Newsom are co-chairing, and which by the summer will have some general ideas of what we should be doing first, and by the summer of 2014, a more Alberts-like panel. So there are parallels here to the Genome Project, but we shouldn't overstate them, because the Genome Project had a much clearer endpoint. I don't think we're going to be done with studying the brain any time in my lifetime or yours. Nonetheless, uh, it was an exciting opportunity to think about sort of the next, as the president called it, the next great American science project uh, to try to see what we could learn about that most complicated structure in biology uh, that we know of in the, in the universe, <laughs> the human brain, but to work up to it gradually just like we did with the human genome. It did attract uh, some attention and some anxiety. So, uh, yeah, there seem to be some similarities here between things that happen in the White House and what people say about it before or after. So I thought it would be fun to give you a little quiz here, which appeared in Wired Magazine. Uh, this came just about a month ago, uh, where uh, there were quotes put forward by Wired, and they asked you to read the quote and to answer the question, was this a quote that was made in about 1988 about the Genome Project, or is it a quote made in 2013 about the Brain Project? So here we go. Okay, I mean, you're, get, you're gonna get the answer here. I'm gonna tell you, is it brain or is it genome? And, and we'll have a little animation so that you'll get to enjoy that part too when you see the answer. So here we go. So here's a quote. The, whatever it is, project is bad science, it's unthought out science, it's hyped science. Is it brain or is it genome? Okay. Genome, they say. Ah, you got it right. All right, let's see. I believe the scientific paradigm underlying this project is at best out of date and at worst simply wrong. I hear brain. Okay, you're doing pretty well here. They aren't all alternating. It's not going to be that easy. <laughs> Concentrating hundreds of millions of dollars on this one mega project in the era of mm, budget cuts is sure to starve hundreds of small, more promising biomedical research projects. Genome. Genome. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> In contrast to some areas of physics, which require extremely expensive facilities, biology does not have an obvious need for big science. Our country's spectacular success in this area has depended in large part on the wide support of independent investigator-initiated peer-reviewed research. Genome. Genome. Oh, yeah. I even remember who said that one. <laughs> I don't know if he does, but we do. <laughs> Creative science is bottom-up, not top-down. Are we talking about central planning inside the beltway? Brain. <laughs> that was actually said by Corey Bargman, who's now the co-chair of the group that's making the plan. <laughs> so the, see, you criticize, this is what happens. We put you to work. Uh, it's going to do absolutely no good to develop tools for a new generation of scientists if we, in the process, seriously damage that same generation of scientists. Hmm? Uh-oh. <laughs> well, we didn't get the answer? Oh, no, it didn't rotate. Well, I guess I don't know. <laughs> to be continued, yes. Yeah, sorry, leaving you hanging there. Arguments are made that the project will give birth to a new generation of technologies. What good will that do in the absence of individuals trained and capable of applying these technologies? Genome. Genome. That was a real concern, and maybe it still is. <laughs> We're still there. The amount of money we asked to accomplish the task, $200 million a year, which has been floated uh, for uh, brain as well as uh, genome, is commensurate with the project's role in the fight against many serious health problems. All right, a positive, yes. And everybody I talk to thinks this is an incredibly bad idea. That was genome. That was genome. Okay, so 
maybe there's a pattern here. And uh, maybe those of us who start these kinds of enterprises or start talking about them uh, remember that. But of course, it doesn't mean just because genome turned out pretty well that the next big science project will turn out pretty well. So you should all be watching carefully here and holding us accountable. Okay, well, briefly, where is this whole thing going? I want to finish up with just a few brief remarks about the future. And again, I'm very much, I think, pointing you towards uh, this uh, issue of nature, uh, which included a really wonderful summary by a lot of people, but Eric and Mark uh, led this enterprise. And I like the graphic that they put forward here about the ways in which this enterprise is going to move forward as sort of as a comet does, but with a very broad reach uh, across all kinds of aspects uh, from sequencing on up to medical applications and that all of those things ultimately uh, will move a little bit to the right but not so fast because clearly we have a lot of work to do on the left side of this as well. And the kinds of things that that paper points out in terms of genomic medicine, genomics-based diagnostics need to become routine, define the gene genetic components of disease, Comprehensive characterization of cancer genomes. We're in the middle of all these things, devising practical systems for clinical genomic informatics, uncovering the role of the human microbiome. Uh, fascinating, and I'm sure Claire talked about that today. And to get to 20, the, all of these goals by 2023, uh, this, uh, these authors lay out uh, some fairly ambitious milestones, understanding the biology of genomes at the level that we don't currently, bioinformatics and computational biology, education and training, and, of course, the important aspect of keeping track of the implications of all this uh, for society uh, beyond the scientific and medical issues. So let me finish with a little bit of a silly futuristic view here about where this will all go, assuming that it goes well. And this is going to be a made-up story about personalized medicine over the next, shall we say, 100 years. So this is about a baby named Hope who was born on April 14, 2003, 10 years ago. Uh, family heard news that the Human Genome Project was completed because that was the day we had a big party at the Library of Congress and said we had achieved all of the goals of the HGP. Well, okay, fast forward uh, 10 years uh, to now. Uh, we're having a 10th anniversary celebration and Hope is turning 10 years old and having a nice party with a lot of balloons. Okay, another 10 years forward, uh, Hope uh, attends a funeral of her aunt who died much too young at age 53, uh, causing the whole family uh, to be quite in grief and wondering what happened. And that led to an interest on the part of the family in actually trying to look at their own family history and say, are there other people who might be at risk and what should we do about that? Uh, at the point uh, where we are right now, the Surgeon General's family medical history tool uh, would be a likely place to go. No doubt it'll be much better in 2023. And in addition, uh, there would be uh, some genome analysis potential, which maybe by 2023 will have somewhat better uh, abilities to make predictions, especially if you combine it with the family history, that free genetic test, uh, maybe we'll be able to say something actually uh, fairly useful for somebody in this situation. And Hope turns out, like her aunt, uh, to have a higher risk of heart attack. And so she decides, okay, I'm not going to smoke, and I'm actually going to watch my weight and exercise and try to do something to reduce that risk. All sounds fine. 30 years go by. <laughs> Hope is celebrating her 50th birthday party in 2053, and she's also taking advantage of new developments in terms of personal health maintenance, wearing a smart shirt, uh, which keeps track of all kinds of uh, bodily functions to make sure that she's doing well. And it's also time for another party because the human genome is 50 years old, and Hope and her family are very attached to this, too, I can, I can assure you. But of course, uh, Hope's getting older, and uh, in 2071, now in her late 60s, Hope feels some tightness in her arm while she's guarding. She thinks maybe it's a pulled muscle, but her smart shirt comes to the rescue, <laughs> says this is not good, picked up some arrhythmia there, calls the emergency responders uh, who arrive. Uh, she is actually treated quickly, and because her uh, information is readily accessible, she gets the right treatment for her uh, and uh, ends up surviving uh, what otherwise might have been a very bad episode. And all goes well. She celebrates her 100th birthday with a night of dancing in 2103. I hope by then the clothes will have changed, but oh well, Hope and her <laughs> husband are still living in the past as far as their wardrobe. So that's a happy outcome, right? 
And that's not too implausible to imagine it might happen. I don't think we stretched too many scientific or social developments. But it didn't have to happen that way. So now the darker side of this. Could we count on that kind of outcome for hope? Well, maybe not. Hope's story gone wrong. In 2023, her aunt dies of the heart attack. This is sort of the teachable moment. But there's no online tool left for family medical history available. Physicians have not learned how to use family history or genetic information. Genome analysis is dismissed. And so uh, nothing really is provided. Back to Hope, she makes some unhealthy life choices, uh, gains weight, uh, maybe smokes occasionally. And what do you know, by 2038, She's developed high blood pressure. She um, basically could have been tested to see what would be the right drug for her hypertension, but that wasn't actually available or hadn't been developed or wasn't uh, paid for. So instead, she got a random drug that causes a hypersensitivity reaction, which was quite unpleasant. She said, these doctors don't know what the hell they're doing, and stopped the treatment. So uh, she continued then, eating an unhealthy diet, gaining more weight, uh, uncontrolled hypertension. And now, in 2053, she feels tightness in her arm while gardening. There's no smart shirt in this scene. Doctor dismisses it as a pulled muscle. She's taken to the ER three hours later in cardiogenic shock, given standard therapy with a prodrug. But you know what? Her particular metabolism was very slow, so she didn't actually metabolize it into the active form. Hope dies in the ER at just 50 years old, having missed out on fully one half of her potential lifespan. So that's not good. And one of the goals, I guess, as we think about the future, is to try to identify the kinds of actions that we have to take as scientists, but also as people who care about the healthcare system, uh, to make sure uh, that we give uh, a better opportunity uh, for this not to have this bad outcome. So basically, the essential goal of genomic medicine, if you want to ask it, what should it be, and get it down to three words, it is to keep hope alive. As you knew that was coming, didn't you? And hope in many ways is all of us. Hope is you, hope is me, hope is our families, our loved ones. We have the promise here with all the knowledge that we are gaining about the genome and how it functions and how it plays out in health and disease. Uh, to turn these coming years uh, into really dramatic advances uh, for medicine as well as for science. But it isn't automatic that that will happen. And things uh, such as this really awful event that we are living through right now called the sequesters, which slow down our momentum, are to be regretted and to be pushed back against. Uh, and we should do everything in our power to continue to make the case that we are engaged in an enterprise which has the potential of enormous advances in human health and actually stimulate the economy, which is something that people pay attention to. And furthermore, that genomics and all of what we do in medical research is not just a random activity. It is a noble enterprise. It is one of those things that I think we are all fortunate to, to be called to be part of, uh, to take uh, the time that we have here on this planet, to spend it in the laboratory or in the clinic, making discoveries about things that have mystified people for all of human history, and then trying to apply them to the betterment of the human condition. What a privilege that is. So I want to thank you all for being here and for putting up with this final silly presentation. And I hope this day will linger in your memory. I know it will in mine. Thank you all very much. I'm going to finish this off now.